Hey, everybody. Welcome to the episode of the I Know a Guy podcast. On this episode, I sit down with Emerald Data Partner CEO, Eric May. On this episode, Eric's going to talk about IT, uh, cybersecurity, backup, process implementation. Um, they work at firms large and small, private and public sector. And one area that I really, really want to know about, artificial intelligence, right? It's kind of taken everybody by storm in the last 12 months or so uh, with some of the different processes that are making things really, really easy. But he's going to talk about that, talk about the cool things with it and the not so cool things with it. So uh, I hope you enjoy this episode of the I Know a Guy podcast. Eric May, I brought you in because our we need you right now. The country needs you. I'm ready. All right. I'm ready to serve. <laughs> right. <laughs> so your company, Emerald Data? Emerald Data Partners. Emerald Data Partners. Does it matter if I say data or data? It doesn't. I'll okay. just correct you. I'll, go, I'll, I'll say the opposite each time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what do you do? Yeah. So we are, it's hard to describe. Uh, the industry calls us a managed service provider, but no one knows what that means. Uh, essentially an outsourced IT company. Um, so we have basically two types of engagements with clients where we either are their full IT department or we supplement their IT department. So like, for example, we have some clients who have several hundred employees. They could afford you know, a couple of IT people. Um, and instead of incurring that cost, they essentially take that money and they get a better service with us. If that makes sense. And yeah, then, sure. And then we have some other engagements where we have people who have an IT department and then we manage parts of their their IT and their networking. So you've been, so this computer stuff, nothing yeah. I say yeah. is to be offensive, right? But I, I love the nerdiness of it, yeah. right? Like you're yeah. into it. It's so important though. It is. Right? It is. And it's, it's very stressful because it all changes. I would say every three to four years, everything just completely changes. Um, and it's just, just wild. It's very unstable. Um, so one of the things, you know, we have a team of nine people. Um, one of the things we look for is people, not what they know, but how they think. Okay. That's a big part of our, our hiring process is how can you adapt? Um, not necessarily are you a brainiac? Do you have a lot of knowledge? Because we know a lot of that IT knowledge is going to be dead in five years, which is wild, right? So the ability to be able to adapt and change because you know it's going to happen. That's right. That's you, right. you run into folks who know IT now, but it's passed them by? Like yeah. they didn't stay? Yeah. You see that sort of with folks as they age, you know, and as we get older, I guess we'll be kind of like that, right? Yeah. You've got the, the person who's maybe – not all, but who's older, who can't operate an iPhone, doesn't know how to get into their photos and their pictures yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, I know that's not in your wheelhouse what you guys are doing, but I'm saying that people's ability to be able to adapt is short of, I guess, time can pass you by and you just don't either stay up with it or grow with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So talk to me about um, how long you've, like, when's, what's the, you ever host, have you hosted a website before? Oh, I I started doing websites. That was actually like my first, like, okay. side hustle when I was like 16. Um, I think actually we had to, like my dad had to sign on the fictitious name, like the state of Florida, because I was <laughs> yeah. too young. Um, so I started doing websites. What year was that, you when, think? Mm, 2003. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So I'm 30, and, I'm 37 now. So yeah, I was about 16. Old man. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. It, it, 2003 doesn't seem that long ago, but it really is when you oh, look gosh. at, there are businesses still to this day that don't have websites. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it's. Yeah, and and you know it's like we have some clients who don't have websites, you know. Not have, not that they don't need it, they need yeah. it, but some some of them don't need it, you know. Some, but some don't, especially I think small businesses know how to do it. There, you know, here's my approach to IT: technology is always changing, and you get what's called shiny box syndrome, where it's like you see the new thing, like oh I got to have that, oh I got to have that. Businesses do it, governments do it, where they're like oh here's the new piece of software, I've got to have that, I got to have that. And it's like, well, what is the goal you're actually trying to solve? Like, what's the problem you're trying to solve? What's the goal you're trying to pursue versus just chasing the new thing? So I tell clients all the time, like something new comes out, they're looking at it like, hey, we want to let's switch this piece of software. I'm like, well, what's the actual goal that you're trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. uh, save time. Okay, well, how is this going to save time? Well, it's going to trim X number of minutes off of a transaction each time. Okay, great. Um, what about the transition costs? How long is it going to take to get there? going to cost $100,000 to implement this software, and it's going to take us two and a half years. I'm like, how long is that going to take you to pay off? And it's like, oh. And they're starting to do the math, and we do it. We'll do it for them in this analysis. And it's like, not like seven years. I'm like, 
And all of a sudden they realize, okay, this is not the wisest decision. Mm. You know what I mean? Like we could actually throw a, uh, a part-time person at this particular function instead of upgrading the software and save money because they just would do this data entry. So those are the kind of analytics that we'll do in IT for people. Like what is actually going to save you time and money? So I'm guilty of what you would you call it the silver the shiny, shiny box syndrome. Yeah, okay, yeah. I have it. Yeah, newest um, iPhone, you got to have it. Close. My brother's like that, Brian. Okay. Okay, me. It's um. So since I started this podcast and uh, mm-hmm. producer Jake taking care of business, you know we're editing the stuff. I'm using Adobe Premiere Pro. The hey. computer that I had wasn't fast enough. Okay. So I need something. So yeah. I go into um the local Best Buy and I see this guy who I love by the way. Every time I'm there, he like he knows. It. You can tell this guy. Now I'm not saying he lives in the basement at his mom's mm-hmm. house and plays video games, but he might because this dude knows his stuff. He's like, hey, yeah. you want this, this, and this. And so I have this big gaming PC type thing okay. to help move things quickly. Yeah. And do you what, edit it yourself? I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, and Jake helps too. Right, and see, Jake? that's that's worth <laughs> it, right? Because like you're saving your time. Right. Yep. You got a family. Like your that's time right. is very precious right now. So it's worth it. Like, what'd you spend probably, you know, maybe you don't want to say. I'll but, tell you. I th- I, I, well, what I think, I, thought, I think the tower is 1500 bucks, maybe. It oh, wasn't okay. even the most expensive stuff. It's, yeah. not, it's not the three to $5,000 range. Yeah. I'm going there eventually. Yeah. Yeah, but like, that's totally worth it, right? He Isn't told that worth me, your he time? said, well, you're right. It is, absolutely, because it moves things quicker at speed. Yep. And I've also timed it to where, look, if I got to <laughs> render a file or something, I'm going to leave. I'm going to do it uh, at the end of a work night, get it yeah. going. I go home and it's doing it on the, on the back end. That's right. But I know that... Um, there's a chance that if somebody like you mm-hmm. and you're like, well, Ben, what's your problem? Well, I need more speed. And you say, well, you probably don't need to spend the money on that. Just buy this piece and put it in. Yeah, and, yeah, you yeah. Say, and I don't know, I don't know that. Right. Cause this stuff's complex. So I'm gonna tell you this issue I had uh, in the last 48 hours. Okay. Microsoft OneDrive. Oh boy. At some point in the past 30 days, I clicked yes, back up. Okay. And it took my entire desktop yeah, and yeah, backed yeah. it to the OneDrive. Good for you. Sort of. Here's the problem. Okay. I don't want it to back up to the OneDrive. Right. I don't mind if the files are there, like the Word, the Excel files. Yeah. I don't need them to be there. But I'm also like, it's on my work computer. That's all I need. Yeah. So when I'm going to look at some, uh, do some editing now in Premiere Pro. Yeah. The podcast actual file of 45 gigabytes for one video file, 4K yeah. is up in the cloud. Yeah. And yeah. me trying to get it back down and work it together. It wasn't working. It wasn't yeah. functioning. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Well, let's just say I literally spent the past two days bringing everything back down yeah. and getting it off of OneDrive. I didn't yeah. mean to put it up there. It's been there a is, nightmare for there me. There is a way, and I, I mean, it's probably boring for this podcast, but there is a way to have it in there and then have it like cached, what's called cached, where you have it available locally. But so you bring up that point. That's an easy decision to make, right? Spend, you know, $2,000 on a nice computer because it saves you time and you get that time with your family because now let's say that trims. I don't know. Let's say it trims like 15 minutes off the editing process. Sure. Like that's worth it. So Absolutely. 15 minutes times every podcast times however many times you do this, that 15 minutes with your family divided by the, the $2,000 you spent, that's a that's worth it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so what's really cool, one of the exciting things we get to do for organizations is do that same thing across the org mm. and say, okay, because imagine you have an organization where you have you know 200 employees, 200 times, 50, times 2,000, we're talking some real dollars absolutely. here. Absolutely. So if we can trim, let's say we they can do a, a thousand dollar computer instead of two thousand dollar computer. Well, what does that mean for the organization? And you have to look at you know certain staff. If they save fifteen minutes, are they going to be able to work on something else, or are they a nine to five and they are putting in that time? Like we have some clients who have client who have employees like that, right? They are there for a certain amount of time. Their efficiency isn't worth that thousand dollars per computer. Mm. So those are the types of things that this is kind of like people oftentimes think like IT is just plugging in parts and all that kind of stuff. That's that consulting side of like, hey, actually, let's downgrade these computers. Let's put in mid-range or low-range computers because across your whole organization, that's going to save you $50,000 wow. every time you replace the computers, right? And that gets you an extra employee, mm-hmm. you know? And that's a that's a priority for them because they say, hey, we're not going to actually cut down. We don't have extra work for these people to do with that efficiency. Whereas you, you're like, hey, at 15 minutes, I got use for that. Absolutely. I got kids. I got stuff to do, you know? Sure. So when you were young... You yeah. worked on a project with your dad. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, you did in first grade. Are you guys are, put together a processor? Oh, my gosh. Did you pull this, like, from my like, history and website? What do you, what do you oh think I'm going to do? You don't think I do my research? I, my, <laughs> yeah, my dad did IT for a long time. Um, he just retired recently, and he was basically like a one-man kind of um, – he ended up – he started out doing all sorts of IT. 
And then in his latter years, he essentially was only doing dentists, just dental IT. Mm -hmm. It was just really random niche. Yeah, that story, um, man, I don't know if I say this on there, but like I messed that computer up. Did I, did I say that in the story? All it, all it says is that you took some old parts and you put it uh, yeah. put a single core 12 megahertz processor together. 12 megahertz. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Anybody in IT knows that I mean, it doesn't mean anything to you. It means nothing. It's a number of cycles per second. So okay. hertz is a cycle per second. So mega and, is millions. So and 12, 12 million cycles per second. And 12 was really good at that time? Yeah, yeah, it was incredible. And now we're like <laughs> three gigahertz, but multi thread. I mean, it's in the billions and you have multi. Yeah, it's crazy. But you know, what's funny is I remember like first computer was putting together old parts. And then I remember I probably was like 10 ish, 11, somewhere around there. And of course, you're, my dad's IT, just computer. So he has, you know, access to parts. It's like, let's build you an actual computer. Um, what's funny is I still have this computer to this day. Do you? I still do. Uh, it was the first new computer we built. And when you put something, you're putting all the parts together, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, I I did something where I had to lift up a little, they call it a pry bar. It's like locks the processor in. And I used a screwdriver. And when I was putting it in, I basically put too much pressure in. And mm. I did what's it's called scored the motherboard, which is where you just you scratch it. Oh, wow. And there's all these little metal pieces. And it basically ruined the motherboard. <sighs> and um, I remember, oh, my gosh, it was like that look on my dad's face of just like, <laughs> like this was a lot of money, you know. This was have been yeah. like in the early '90s, mid '90s, and this was that was probably like a, you know, two hundred dollar part, which of course, you know, golly, back then, yeah, with inflation, that was like a million dollars, you know. What I mean? Sure. So yeah, that really taught me just those little lessons, little hands on things, man. Oh, so Dude. now still to this day, like I'm super cautious because yeah. we'll work on servers that are you know fifty, sixty thousand dollars just for that one piece, of that server. You wow. know what I mean? Like that's the type of stuff we'd be working on. And you know I am like, if I'm uh -huh. the one working on it or if I'm training somebody, it's like I am very particular with my hand movements. and Crazy all... how a lesson at that age yeah. is carried on to where you're like, I've yeah. done it. I've... Isn't it weird? Like you try to, like we think that we're like, oh, I'm not going to be like my parents. I'm going to venture away. I'm going to do better. And it's like I'm doing the same thing mm -hmm. my dad did. I'm like teaching my kids like the same stuff. Well, uh. it's, it's you know, you know my brother Brian yeah. a little bit. And um, I remember... This is early 90s. There's a video from when he was in school. Um, his project, I don't know what his project was supposed to be, but all I know is the old big camera recorder with the full cassette tape in it. Oh, yeah. Right, VHS tape? Oh, yeah. And he's filming himself taking apart an engine and explaining what pistons are and rods and all this stuff. Oh. He can do computers, yeah. cars, anything we've been broken down on the ocean yeah and he's opening up a thing in the back and going here's the issue figuring out there's water and the gas and then siphoning and doing stuff this is all really happened so he's like our macgyver that's like on the ocean that happened that ha we've had, had two things happen like that one was in uh, awesome. one was in the intercoastal waterway in saint augustine okay um <laughs> sidebar quick story we're on the intercoastal waterway in this 1970 something orlando clipper which is a boat that's really made for divers sort of to go out and do dive stuff but we you know got it for 900 dollars or something and <laughs> it had a 1984 Mercury um, okay. outboard on it, and Brian knows how to fix stuff. We figured out, you know, that the, there were some issues on it. It wasn't firing right. It was a power pack issue. Mm. And we see this boat stranded, and we're like, well, we're good to go. Let's help these people out. And so mm -hmm. I jump out the boat, and I'm pushing them off the shore because they're kind of banked up on an oyster. My feet are going 18 inches deep in this mud. I can Ugh. feel oysters underneath my feet. Ugh. We start towing them out of there. We all get in the boat, and we're pulling them, trying to get into a boat ramp, and then our our engine starts messing up. Oh. Like two boats hooked together, both <laughs> both messed up. That's actually the time that the, the we, re, we realized that the uh, water was in the gas. Okay. And said, okay, here's what's going on. He's working on it. He's got screwdrivers out, different yeah. things, spraying stuff inside the, I don't know, the carburetor or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. But that's his thing. So I had no idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, talk to me about artificial intelligence. Oh, boy. This is the big one, right? Oh, boy. So you, yeah. you did a blog recently. Back I in did. June, it was like uh, three things that yeah, every organization yeah, yeah. should do about AI, right? You yeah. just said add employee uh, language to your yeah, yeah, uh, employee yeah. manual. Um, ask your main software company about the use yep. of AI, if they're using, how they're using it, yeah. and don't be afraid to use or not use. Why is it important to know about your a software company if they're using AI or not, do you think? Oh, the second point? Um, yeah, the second one. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's this cool trend, uh, like you hinted beforehand, like there's um, – Every industry tends to have like a, a core software, right? Like so ours in the IT industry, we've got a couple of them. So meaning like a software that helps you run like in property management, there's a property management mm -hmm. software. Everybody has these different types of softwares and 
those guys typically have their finger on the pulse of kind of what's going on in the market, what the needs are. So you imagine like for property management, you know, if they're making software for that or like, you know, multiple listing service, you know, it's like Stellar, mm -hmm. those guys, you know, they they have contact with hundreds of different real, you know, real estate associations. Mm -hmm. They are getting feedback on what they need. So those guys are the ones, and they're already programmers, they're the ones who are most likely to use AI in a productive sense that can actually help your business. A lot of what's going on right now with AI from like a business standpoint, uh, like a government and organizational standpoint, a lot of it's just hype. You know, there's definitely certain use cases. There's like a lot of like, um, there's a guy I know who runs um, campaigns in another state and I was showing him how to use it and he's using it to, to run social media now. He's just like, hey, write a blog post about this person, that person. And like he's, he's using ChatGPT and it will like save him probably about 30 minutes of just writing a post for one of his clients and it's free, you know? And so that's a super cool use case. Um, a lot of people are thinking like AI is going to take over the world. This is Terminator and all this stuff. It's like, no, that's not, we're not there yet. You know what I mean? Like it's not completely automating your job. Um, but does that, does that make sense? It, like it does make sense. And I know that when you said chat GPT, um, Jake, you got a problem with that with people that are, you know, using, um, that type of stuff. Didn't you tell me? Cause I tell you, I like to use it and you said it's going to ruin was, mm. Didn't you have some thoughts on? Because um, I like to use it to ask questions. Just as far as it like <laughs> um, kind of being a handicap for yeah. just normal function. I mean, like uh, I am horrible with directions because of Google Maps. And mm. I feel like uh, ChatGPT is probably going to be the uh, the same way, but for writers. And, and, uh, so you're really thinking like the next generation is going to have like – a skill gap, like they're not going to know how to do certain things because they've relied on Chat GPT. Yeah, sure, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Well, you know, um, if if um, I know, I think one of the strengths that I have mm -hmm. is I know what I don't know, mm -hmm. and if Chat GPT can take care of that for me, yeah. And if I can say, I did this today, by the way, on there just as a test. I said, write me a poem about sunsets, uh, about um, excuse me, rivers, mountains, and oceans. Okay, and um, here comes this beautiful po poem. About the you going to read it? Um, I left it on my computer. Oh, but okay. I, but I, yeah. Otherwise, I was going to get emotional if I read it, you know, because it was <laughs> it was my first poem written to me by chat by AI. <laughs> but I get the, um, I think the creativeness. Do you, yeah. do you do you lead the lose the ability to create uh, critically think or be creative yeah. Yeah. with because you're just saying hey do it and it's writing it and it's writing it in ten seconds. Yeah. When I wrote a paper. I did a study on, yeah, I think it was Best Buy and J.C. Penney back in college from a business degree, mm. and talking about marketing. It took me hours and hours and hours of research, and then days to sit down over time mm. to write this twenty-something page paper. Yeah, double spaced, so ten full pages. But I could write that paper yeah. in five minutes. Yeah, with this I could say, take Best Buy, yeah. uh, write write a a. a 5,000 word paper yeah. about their marketing practices, how they've changed over the yeah. years and blah, blah, blah. And here goes, it does it for you. I know. I know we do. We have. And uh, why is that wrong though? Well, it's Jake's point. You're, you're missing on a life skill. Uh, sidebar. When you did your research, have you ever heard of the town of Penny farms? No. Oh my gosh. So JC Penny, oh, the guy, okay. like not the store, but the guy, Founded a town. It's over near Camp Blanding in that area. Really? It's still there. It's a municipality. It's a legal oh, so municipality. It's here in Florida, yeah. It's here in Florida, yeah. Probably an hour drive or so. And basically, he had this random vision is that a lot of church ministers, when they get older, they don't have like proper retirement and they don't have a good place to live. So he envisioned this community and it's still out there. Wow. So it's this like small, probably like five, six hundred person community. It's like got a clerk and a manager and a retirement home and all this stuff. Wow. And it's the town of Penny Farms. It's beautiful. I it's, wow. So that's, and that's because of J.C. Penny. The, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's just a random, I was like, you know, and they have a, like a bronze statue of him and everything. I'm oh, like, that's cool. What a random thing. I got to check that out for sure. Because yeah. yeah. I've driven out there way, that way a million times. Mm -hmm. Never knew. Or the trees are all like, if you ever go that way. and you, I, when, Yeah. I've that's, done it. You, you'll drive right past it. Then I'll, okay. Thanks yeah. for information. Anyway. Well, so here's here's the thing about J.C. Penny, And I don't want to go off, because I want to get back to the AI. And I can get on these yeah. rabbit holes. Because it's a stick. It's, it's a pet peeve for mine. Um, their marketing, and I haven't been there in a while. I don't shop there a ton unless I have to. And thank you, Amazon. No, if, if I need pants or something. But here's the deal with JCPenney. What they did 
is they've got this really, really cool marketing of uh, 70% off, buy one, get one free, buy two, get one, this whole thing, right? right? So they had this company come in, and this company had done the same exact thing with Sears, and it failed with Sears, which is stop doing all these discounts and all these Mm -hmm. uh, coupon stuff. Put your rates flat. So Mm. if a pair of pants were, uh, uh, say you get two for uh, three for 60 bucks, Mm -hmm. just make them 20 bucks a piece year round. Stop these different sales and these gimmicks. Yeah. When they did, when they got rid of the red dot special and this thing, their sales tanked. The wow. price that I could walk in and get pants for was the same price yeah. during their sales. I'd have yeah. to wait for the sale, yeah. but it was the same price. But what happened were, was people didn't feel good yeah. about their experience. Yeah. They couldn't walk out with a receipt that said, I say $450. Yeah, yeah. And so they had to go back to raise the price back up, and yeah. now you're getting 60% off because it feels better. Yeah, and Interesting. that's funny. It's the perceived experience. Yeah. We deal with it a lot in IT. <clears throat> Um, when we when we meet with clients, especially people who have no IT knowledge, because it's like, hey, this stuff's got to work, and they don't understand. You know, like if you build a house or like if you buy a car. So imagine you're like a business owner, and you got to buy a tractor. It's like, okay, that makes sense. That thing's gonna plow the field. Like I can see the tires, I can touch it. And, you know, you ever seen the price of like a good tractor, like a com- like a sure. farm commercial sure. tractor? I mean, some of these things are getting up like a million dollars. Yep. You know, yep. like it's insane. But these guys, they look at like, okay, the value, and they can touch it. And then you get into areas like IT and technology, and it becomes very intangible. And you're yeah. like, I don't understand. And that's like a big part of it's a big part of what I do. But like, it's tough sometimes. But I'll tell you, um, Verizon does. I don't. It's very random. Verizon does. They call it the data breach. Um, it's the DBIR. It's like investigative report. They basically look at all the breaches. So a breach is like when an, a threat actor, a hacker. Sure. But that's just the modern term for it. When they get into a network, and they have something called a dwell time. So this is whenever somebody gets into a network, you know, Ukrainian hacker, whatever, yeah. whoever they're from, from the time they get into the network until the time they're discovered. Do you know what the average? That's called dwell time. Okay. Do you know what the average dwell time is, according to this uh, data breach? No. Um, it hovers between eighty and a hundred days that they're in. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, you know, isn't it fascinating? Like back in the day, you get a virus, like your computer would shut down. Absolutely. And you would know, you're like, oh, and you'd bring it to the guy down the street, like, hey, <laughs> yep. my computer, like, oh, I got you, man. And put some duct tape and, you know, like they get the virus off. Like nowadays, it's a completely different landscape. People get in and they and they analyze, they're looking, they, they sit quietly, they're trying to see what do you have, do you have passwords, they're trying to figure out who you are, what's the best way they can extract money from you. Um, I think about like the from a municipality standpoint, the city of Lake City. I don't know if you remember this, but a couple of years mm-hmm. ago they were attacked. And they had and somebody a, was it ransom. Yeah, ransomware, and they hung out and hung out in the networks, locked everything, and then they charged them a ransom. And I want to say, uh, with the exchange rate, it ended up being like four hundred thousand dollars, and they paid it. I think their insurance reimbursed them, um, <laughs> but they paid it, and I think they still didn't get everything back. But it was completely crippling to them for a long time. Wow. So that's why you know. It's making it easier for like us to to talk to decision makers because this stuff is real. It's actually happening. Um, you know, MGM just got hacked. Like the huge, you know, MGM yeah. like Vegas. Like they weren't able to do reservations. Like it was like detrimental to them. Um, you know how they got in? This is fascinating. I don't know if you guys know this already. I'm no, I don't know more. anything. All this is fascinating, and this is in our world, yeah. so it's good. Yeah. So the hacker. What what term do you prefer? Because threat actor is the new term, a lot, but a lot of people say hacker. So, but threat actor. I've always said hacker, but I don't right, I'll care. say hacker for you. The hacker. This is what they did. They went on the LinkedIn and they found an employee that worked at MGM, and they just basically studied him for like 10, 15 minutes. Got their name, what their job was, all that kind of stuff, and then they called the MGM help desk, the IT help desk, and posed as that person. Hi, I'm so and so. Oh my god! Just reading their LinkedIn profile. With good English accent, you know, just kind of did a good job. Um, and all this, you know, the details are a little fuzzy, but I think it'll all come out and be clear soon. And they essentially used that to reset some credentials, fancy word for pass, username and password, and they were able to get into the network and then, boom, infiltrate it and then bring them down and essentially um, extort them. Wow. Yeah. How, how, how do you think they figured out that that was how they got in, that direction through LinkedIn and all that? Um, I don't remember how they figured that part out. That was kind of a preliminary report. Um, some of the circles that I'm in, um, usually the information that they, they will usually debrief afterwards. 
Um, it's kind of like the community. I don't know if like aviation is like this, where like if, if you ever go on YouTube and just type in like aviation case studies, they love to study like pilots love to study why planes crash because it helps other pilots be safe. Sure. And it's the same thing with information security and IT where we say, hey, we'd like to study how people get in because it helps the rest of us prevent it. Gotcha. So there's a guy that um, I don't have his name in front of. Oh, yeah, it's called Sc- uh, Scammer Payback. He's on YouTube. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So he's like f- 6 million followers or yeah. something. Is this the guy who does the voices? Does he wear sunglasses? Um, I don't know. This is the this is the guy who goes in and he, it's, it's, it's the scam. Like, you just bought this Amazon thing for $699 and they call and they say, send over $200 right now and we'll do this. And he kind of gets in the middle and he calls people up and says, hey, yeah. look, I want you to know I've been tra- tracking this. You're, you've gotten scammed. Oh, okay. And then he okay. calls the scammers and activates their webcams yeah, yeah, yeah. and is watching them. Yeah. And they're really, it's really awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's kind of fascinating. Yeah. Have you ever had a situation where you caught like a, a you call them dweller, you said? D- or they're uh, dwelling? Threat, they're dwelling. Yeah. It's a threat actor is like the real official name. I'm um, going to be official now and call it threat actor. So have you ever caught one? Have like, we caught? Um, it's offensive now. Heck, sorry, <laughs> hacker is an offensive term. I'm offended by that. Yeah, um, yeah. I I am curious why it changed. Like threat actor is now the more generic term. Um, have we caught anybody inside? Um, I'd have to think that I, I. We've definitely had evidence of stuff like we've seen hands on keyboards. What's called hands on keyboard. Okay. We actually have somebody trying to get in. You can see them typing. So really, like one of the yeah. Um, I don't think we've really caught any somebody inside the network before. That's we've got a lot of protections and things, so that hasn't happened. Thankfully, um, we have processes, procedures, and insurance in place if that were to happen. Um, but no, we have so we have something called a honeypot. Man, you're gonna love this. Okay. So a honeypot is a it's a fake server that's basically just open and it's just waiting for somebody to log into. And we have these deployed at clients, so like it sits there on their network and no one's supposed to be logging into it. And if somebody does, it immediately alarms. Like, I actually will personally get texted on this one. A couple other people do as well. And it will start showing you what they're doing because that indicates somebody's poking around the network, which they shouldn't be, right? That's probably mm. a hacker who's trying to get in. And that's our one of our early warning signs, which, of course, then we're trying to get that computer isolated and figure out what the damage is. So it's like bait. It's bait. Right. They call it a honeypot because it's like... You know, it kind of lures. I don't mm-hmm. know. The honeypots lure bears, or are they luring bees? I don't know. But it's like you know, you think it lures them in there, and then they're kind of stuck, and we see them. Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah. So these hackers, excuse me, these act, threat actors, threat actors, yes, sir. They, when you block them out, they just sort of go somewhere else, right? They go get another computer, another IP, another. Depends. Yeah. Can you? Can, are there situations where? And maybe this is more at the U.S. government level mm-hmm. that you turn around, and you actually fry their stuff, that you know they're there, and you turn around and almost do um, like a defense type thing, sure. where you sure bug their system and do yeah. stuff. I mean, if, if they're in your system, does that mean you could be in theirs, or not? Not necessarily. Yeah, that's a great question. So that is definitely above like what I do, but I can definitely talk about it theoretically. So um, if if somebody were to infiltrate your network, one of the things you have in your it's called incident response plan. And one of the things you're supposed to do is if you believe it's international, which it almost always is, then you're supposed to contact, um, there's a division of Homeland Security and essentially they they connect with FBI and they have agencies and they may, they may want to do that. They will actually work with you. Um, so they don't want you to immediately kick somebody out. Oh, right. Because they want, they may want information about it. So you, and all this stuff is really hush hush. You're not going to find it really talked about real publicly. Um, but yes, you're you're right. The government would, in that case, work with you and say, "Okay, what do you know?" They might even take over. Um, there's a lot of pieces to this. Um, your insurance company, because there's cyber liability insurance, where they will pay for your damages, things like that. They will also kind of drive the ship and tell you what to do. Um, they may tell, "Hey, we need to reach out to the FBI," you know, on this breach. And yeah, they could do something like that. But that's really above. Sure. I, I don't have any personal knowledge of that kind I of stuff. I got you. Um, we have personal knowledge of like. People getting, you know, wire fraud and that kind of stuff. We have clients that that's happened to where they'll lose money. Um, the FBI is able to recover it. And a couple of times, you know, we'll file the reports for them, which has been mm. just really a godsend. But, um, yeah, as far as, like, sure. hacking back, oh, yeah, I'm sure it happens. So NSA, National Security Agency, announces new artificial intelligence security center, like, last two days being built. That's oh, needed. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's it's, it's moving and evolving quickly. Yeah. Um, what was, when was the first time? So in the last three months, chat GPT or whatever, mm-hmm. 
this is not my world. So we just heard about it in the last few months. Is this something you've seen in the last few years, kind of models popping up in your experience? Or Yeah, yeah. Um, I first saw it a couple years ago using it. Um, there were models. We, we started using it to try to train it to look at video cameras to identify and, like, um, I'm trying to think of a project we had about two years ago. We were using AI to try to count wait time. So like we had a video camera for a client in their lobby, and we were essentially trying to see to track somebody when they went in. This is what the AI would do. When they walk in, how long are they in that lobby for? And then we could calculate the wait time. And so we had somebody kind of developing. And that's it was kind so of a neat awesome. little side yeah, project, wasn't yeah. it cool? Um, so that's the kind of stuff. Of course, now that stuff is like that's a dime a dozen. You know, that like camera systems almost can easily do that kind of stuff. Um, but then, you know, then there's also the money side, right? So you have these software companies that develop some, I mean, how much is that worth? You know, like, is that worth something to, you know, target or somebody else? And then all of a sudden you're like, well, why do I care about my wait time? You know, and then you're trying to market it. You know, there's the whole economic side. AI is just so wild. I mean, Microsoft's getting into it, but they're pouring billions B, you know, cause they have mm. a, they have a partial ownership in um, in open AI. Um, so they're, they're pouring a lot of money into it, but it's very unknown what's the return going to be. Sure. Well, AI for me is something, when I was younger in elementary school, so we're in the late 80s, early 90s, we had books where it had this, you know, almost like George Jetson type thing where yeah. the house locks itself and the house um, turns everything on and off and the house refrigerator opens and it cooks the food for you. Yeah. And it's like, oh my God, this is so futuristic. And then yeah. you're in t- here we are in 2023 and you're like, Maybe yeah. not. Maybe yeah. this is around the corner and AI is helping do it. Yeah. Um, new AI tool can accurately diagnose eye conditions could help Parkinson's. AI is helping the healthcare industry cut wait times for patients, save thousands of hours on data retrieval. Um, yeah. AI could become the new Dr. Google because everybody Googles symptoms and uh, stuff. Are you like that? Are you a Google? Are you? Like- um, it's not good to do that. Oh, but are you I, like that? No. Okay. Because okay. I know that um, I had a headache. The other oh day? yeah, oh yeah, and you Google it, and like you've diagnosed yourself with cancer, like, right? Exactly. Like I'm done. Like I'm writing my last will. Like yes, yeah, right. I know. Yeah, it's no, no, Google. no, 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 no. So when we first, um, my daughter was born. Okay. Uh, she had some different things happening. Oh yeah. Um, mainly, mainly ear infections, mastoiditis, and things that could have been bad, but yeah, nothing incredibly crazy. Yeah. Um, but enough to where it's like, okay, she's sounds like a seal, and she's coughing, and she's mm. having trouble breathing. What is this? Mm take her to the emergency room. This could be, you know, oh, yeah, and we yeah. did, but at the same time, anytime it's respiratory, you got to go. Yeah. But you just stay off Google because it doesn't know. That's right. And what I found is where, which I find appealing about AI is that, um, the doctors don't always know. Right. The doctors are great and they, right. they, they have served an incredible purpose. Um, but my daughter's case, um, she had what was called mastoiditis. So it's an inner ear infection okay. that leaves the ear. And then goes behind the ear to the brain, toward the brain. Oh wow! Okay, that's pretty serious. Oh yeah, it, gets the, serious. It, it can be right. So behind the ear is this honeycomb-like okay. cartilage, and if it goes into that and through to the brain, then it can create issues. So the night, the day before, the night before we took her to aftercare, uh, ER. Yeah. Um, Peds after hours. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Real, exactly. Real, right. Not that I'm familiar with it, but yeah. Um, and there's a doctor looks in her ear, said she looks good. It's just swimmer's ear. Yeah. Okay, well, I had swimmers here growing up. Yeah. Take her to school the next day. I said, yes, yeah, she had a little ear infection. We're working on it. So it's just swimmers here. And then by that afternoon, daycare calls and says, we've seen swimmers here, and this doesn't look like swimmers here. Her ears mm. um, almost um, distorted and coming down. It's just, wow. yeah. And it looked like something out of Star Trek. And so we took her to the ER, and they immediately put her on the strongest cocktail before they did any work. Just said, yeah. there's something going on. Let's get it. And then. Within an hour or so, this is mastoiditis, and they yeah. had her ready for surgery the next day. And basically, surgery is going in and draining the area. Mm-hmm. And I guess when you, they prick it, if it goes in, that means it's going to the brain. That's not good. Okay. Uh, there's more work to be done. If it comes out, which it did, yeah. then success. So it was caught, but at the same time. That's huge. It is. Um, and my point in saying that is when we were in the hospital for a few days, a doctor came in with students and he's mm-hmm. saying, look, we've been taught our entire life that the ear looks like this and yeah. it looks clean or looks like this. It's possible that, you know, okay, they're good. Well, maybe it's not good. And you'd be yeah. aware that the infection could have left the ear. It looks okay. Yeah. Calling it swimmer's ear, but it's actually somewhere else. Yeah. And so this is a doctor who's been doing this for decades that didn't have, I think AI can come in and really help analyze data quickly. Yeah. But, you know, the problem with AI is it, it gets things wrong. And it doesn't, it confidently gets things wrong. 
So if you ever done with chat, I've seen it with chat GPT, like I'll ask it something and it will tell me something that's like, I know is wrong. Like I'll ask it to diagnose. We, we sometimes will use it to, and this is one of my points in my blog post. Like you need to have HR policies to allow mm-hmm. how you can use it. We'll use it to write scripts and stuff for us. And, um, it'll, it'll do that. Save you a good 30, 40 minutes of writing, uh, like PowerShell scripts, yep. like behind the scene, not like movie scripts. <laughs> um, and it'll have things just way wrong. Like, and I'll look, we'll look at it like, oh my gosh, and we'll tell it. And it's like, oh, sorry. And it just pivots and goes back. And you're like, wow, this thing had no idea. Like, it looked so right. And if somebody be like, man, that's so, that's so really cool. But like, AI gets things wrong and it doesn't tell you, it doesn't say like, hey, I'm not really sure about this. AI will just get it wrong and be confident, be like, this is right. That's my concern with it in medicine. You know, mm. is like, it's going to be so wrong or like AI self driving cars. That's my problem is like, it's just going to get wrong and just just yank the wheel. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's the kind of stuff. Like the guy, remember the Tesla guy who died? Um, it was in Williston, I think, where the guy mm. who got, you know, I think. The, yeah. The, you know what I'm talking about? I, don't uh, know I, I heard about the accident. It was pretty rough, you know. But, man. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Man, I think that's I'm, kids, man. I, I had to take, I know we're uh, pivoting all over. Yeah. We had to take my, I have four I have four kids um, and one son, three, three daughters. And um, the... The son was like, I forget what it was, something we had to take him to the ER and it ended up being like he was just backed up, like just his bowels were just mm-hmm. backed up. And that was like, but it became so bad, like they had to do all this stuff in the ER. They had to do like a CT scan mm-hmm. and like all this where it like exposes him to radiation, sure. which is not uh, really no, like, no, of course. And it's not safe. It's not good for them, but they weighed the options like we need to know what's going on in there. And man, I tell you, I don't know about you, but like something about sitting in a room with a hospital with this helpless child, like. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And that was like a probably a three, you know, two day experience. But like, I can't imagine these parents who like spend months in NICU uh-huh. or like, you know, the chance of, oh, I, I couldn't do it. So, one of my guests coming here in the next week or so is, is from the Ronald McDonald House oh, and is going to talk about thank God for them. what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Because <clears throat> that's, that's hard. I mean, and with us, um, we were in there for, I think, four days for the mastoiditis and, different things happen so you get to hear the stories it's not just well you're there and you're in this room and by the way the room is beautiful and they've kind of created this mm-hmm. environment that makes it more mm-hmm. a lot more comfortable for was the families it was yeah yeah the little she, portholes i don't know were you in the er yeah we, uh er and then transferred i don't know where we were yeah oh, their er the has PL like are, they make it look like it's like a ship they have like little portholes oh, on yeah. the windows okay and that, just like that kind of cool once stuff. once they moved us to an actual room though oh, so yeah yeah, yeah those yeah. are nice yeah, yeah exactly and so but then you get to hear you hear the other stories about what's going on because doctors were supposed to come in at 10 o'clock and they're like they were but there's a baby that just came in that's got mm-hmm. whatever they need they're down there it's an emergency <laughs> when, when my other daughter emma was born um she had to do this they call it seat belt challenge she has to mm-hmm. be able to sit in a seat uh, a car seat challenge for 45 minutes and her oxygen stay at a certain level mm-hmm. and uh, if it does not she has to wait another day and come back the next day and do it again until she's strong enough to sit up and yeah. breathe and get at least get home and uh, it got delayed because there were other more pressing matters. And so I got I got goes. mad respect for doctors and nurses and I, all the folks working in the medical industry because I couldn't do it. It's, I, it's, it's yeah. tough. It's tough. You know, I just pivoting around, you yeah, know, yeah. back it was 10 years ago. This past March was 10 years ago. Uh, my wife was a school teacher out at Brooker Elementary. Mm-hmm. And she's she had a um, some kind of a night event. I don't know what it was, like something where they had – uh, maybe some standardized tests were changing or something, and they had like not like an open house, but kind of something like that. It would have been March, and we were going to meet her. I, her sister was with me. We were going to meet. Um, basically, she was going to do that event, and then we were going to meet at McDonald's, and then like the parking ride. Sure. And the parking ride wasn't there back then. I don't know. Somewhere in Alachua, we're going to yeah, meet, yeah. and then drive down to Vero Beach, which is where my wife is from. And um, and so we're in the drive-through of McDonald's. My wife mm-hmm. is driving back, so this would have been like near like Hague in that mm-hmm. area. And I get a call from this unknown number, 352-318 something. I probably still remember it. Um, and I answered, and I was like, hello? And he said, is this Jenna May's husband? Mm. And I said, yes. Like, uh, she's just been in an accident. She can't feel her legs, and you need to get over here. That's a real thing. That's what this person said to me. Mm-hmm. I'm like, mm-hmm. what? Mm-hmm. It was a bystander. So my wife had gotten in a head-on car accident. Somebody cut in front of her head-on car accident, and a bystander was there and, like, came up and used her phone to call. And my wife just said the number. So I was able to drive. I drove. I sped. Can they run tickets? Is there statute limitations on tickets? <laughs> I drove. I ran every stop sign. I wow. drove. I can tell you exactly how I drove up 235 to yep. get up there. And I dro- drove so fast. I mean, like, I, I mean, probably at least 100. Wow. Um, and I remember driving there. And I was just like, 
I mean, my world was like rocked. Yeah, of you course. know, like you just your mind's running, and I'm just and I was literally as I'm driving, I'm like God, you're gonna have to take care of my wife. Like, I don't know what state I'm gonna find. I'm like, she has to be okay. Like she has mm-hmm. to be okay. This has to be okay, God. Like I I don't know what I'm gonna do. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna believe in you if she's not okay. That was like my wow. real and my yeah. sister my sister in law sitting in the car. I was just very real. I'm like she has to be. So I get there and Lacrosse was the closest fire department. They're volunteer only. And so they didn't have the jaws of life. And I guess because they're training different stuff. So they didn't actually have jaws of life on there. So they were stabilizing her in her car. And she's based. So I got to actually get there in her little Saturn and she had not been ext- extricated yet. And I'm talking with her and like get to pray with her. And she's sitting there and she had like, she told me she had like touched her leg and it, her leg went down. Like she had broken her femur. Oh. Yeah. Real bad. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. So I got to like sit with her in the car and then you not sit in the car, but stand outside the window because sure. the window smashed out. And um, just for probably like two or three minutes. And then the uh, Alachua County Fire Rescue out of Alachua showed up and they pulled her out. And then we rode in the hospital and um, spent um, a full 30 days in the Shan system, full 30 days before we were discharged. And, um, you know, and she's ended up great. We've had, you know, three biological kids since then. And just, you know, God's been really good to us since then. She's very little um, issues and things like that. Everything really worked out. Um, but man, just, you were talking about like yeah. a gut wrenching moment, sure. like, Oh, does so. she remember the accident? Does she remember you being there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. She remembers it. Um, she remembers it pretty well. It took her a while to kind of get from like comfortable driving again. Um, but yeah, she definitely remembers we drove by, I think at the one year mark, we drove by the site. Um, there was actually still some like debris there yeah. and uh, like, still remember where it was at. It, you know, the hardest part, it took a long time to forgive the person who, who hit her. Yeah. They pulled right in front of her. Um, and inex- like just, it made no sense. You know, 50, it's like a 55 mile an hour head on collision. It was really bad. Mm. Um, and they believe the other driver, the area where it was like, it was a drug, drug known drug activity yeah. and officers basically like, we're pretty sure she was going to get drugs or had just gotten them. And I spent probably a, a, a good six to nine months just really in like a very angry state of that person. Yeah. This person had kind of wrecked my life. Cause I had, I, I ended up losing my job. Um, and then I had, I had to become her full-time caretaker for six months. And I'm, you know, so that would have been 2013. So, I mean, I was 20, 26. I don't know if I have to do the math on that. Mm-hmm. Um, 10 years ago. Yeah. <clears throat> 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it was 26 and like, it was just very strange. Like I had to help my wife go to the bathroom. Like mm-hmm. we had to widen all the doors at our house to get, you know, we had to remodel it really quickly to, mm-hmm. so wheelchairs could get in and out. Um, it was just a very weird time. Um, you know, our whole life was consumed with going to doctor's visits. That was the whole week. We would just go to the doctor's visits and we had to use like a transport company. I mean, and you're 26, you know, mm-hmm. this is like the young fun age and it's like, oh. And so it took a long time to really like get past it. I mean, now I look back and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful she's alive. Sure. You know, like I, t- I tell us all the time, like I, you know, had a lot of stuff going on when I was younger, had a lot of challenges. And like my wife just brings out the good things in me. And like, if, if she had died or if she had been like seriously injured where we couldn't be like <laughs> really, I, I don't know what I would have done. Like I would be a different person. My life would be really messed up. Um, so, you know, it's, it's nice. It's good to reframe and be thankful. I'm like, she's alive, you know, and ended up being all broken bones, nothing else. Wow. And then crazy, no organ damage, just broken bones. Um, so she had like seven, 17 bones broken, uh, seven surgeries, man. You want to talk about people who are heroes. I remember like these orthopedic surgeons, these guys would like to do surgery at like midnight. They said that was like their thing because like these guys would come in, they're looking real groggy. Mm-hmm. Like, all right, we're going to go operate. I'm like, it's midnight. Like, are you like, <laughs> yeah. like you're, they're coming to get her. I was like, yeah. And the nurse told me, he's like, yeah, they're kind of cowboys. Like they just kind of, the, the adrenaline gets going. They like to do it late at night. I'm like, okay, this is weird. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. And these surgeons and they come out like, all right, everything went great. I'm like, okay. You know? <sighs> so just like, you know, you want to talk about like having no control, you know, like just nothing. You're just there to just care for somebody. And it's like, and you have nothing you can do to like, I can't fix bones. I can't, you know, get this person to pay our, you know, $400,000 in medical bills, you know, that they don't have insurance sure. or you know, all this kind of stuff. Like, what can I do? Do you think looking back at that moment and losing your job mm-hmm. and all that you went through mm-hmm. and look at you now with eight, nine employees in mm-hmm. your own company, Yeah, would you have been where you're at now if you'd not had those challenges? That's a great question. Um, you know, it sounds like something a, a therapist would say to me and, and help me. You're right. I mean, it's true. Um, 
you know, we can't go back and change things, right? We can't go back. I mean, I think that it, it reset my life, and it's a great point that I was always interested in IT, but as my <laughs> wife started to progress and get better, um, she still needed some help, but not full-time. Mm-hmm. I was like, hey, what do you think if I go to Santa Fe College for their IT program? And she's like, nope. You know, and then I was like asked again and I started in the summer and basically went through their IT program and essentially got certifications and got all the knowledge and the skills that then allowed me to actually really get into IT. Because I was kind of dabbling in it, but right. to really get into it, you've got to get like some industry certifications and get certain types of knowledge um, and networking and servers, things like that. So in some ways that did have like a reset, you know, um, so I guess to answer your question, like I no, I probably wouldn't have, you yeah. know. I'm really thankful. Um, you know, my wife went back to teaching um, the next year, 2014. And as I was, as I was moving her in um, to her classroom, I remember I like noticed something on the wall, uh, one of their access points, which is just how you get wireless. And I was like, oh, I wonder what IT is doing here. And I went and talked to the principal and she was on her way to sign. She was like, I said, what are you doing for IT? And she, her eyes get really big. She's like, why? I was like, oh, I just kind of noticed this. She goes, I was on my way to sign a contract with an out of town IT company like three hours away mm. that she had met at some conference or something. And because their IT was so bad, this is a local uh, yeah. independent school. So, and I was like, Oh, I'd love to talk. She's like, do you do that? I'm like, yeah. And this was like very early yeah. days in the company and um, clients still to this day, one of my favorite clients, wow. to deal with, you know, still nine years later. Um, we, and that's, what's funny. Like we don't lose clients unless they go out of business. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Like in the nine years we've been doing it, like we have lost them, but that's the only thing is if they go out of business. And it's always tough. I mean, you get connected people, but um, if you take care of people and you treat them right and you keep their stuff secure and you keep them working, like you have a client for life, you know, in IT. It's complex. It's not easy. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's also, how do I say this nicely? For a lot of people, it's boring. Yeah. And so they're not going to pay attention to it. Yeah. And it's a lot to learn. It's, it's, it's it's not boring. That's probably a bad word. It's complex. It's complex, at least to me. Yeah. Like I'm trying to get my stuff off a of OneDrive folder and pulling my hair out and watching YouTube videos and trying to figure this stuff out. Right. And I'm getting errors. You don't have enough disk space. I'm like, why don't I have disk space? I, I upgrade my one terabyte to a two terabyte. Yep. And it says you still don't have space, but it's my C drive that doesn't have the space. Yep. And it's killing me. And I finally figured it out 10 minutes before you walked in. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. I'm going to yeah. tell you, I'll tell you about, you know, you're familiar with Cox Communications and oh, Cox yeah, yeah. Internet and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So here's something they do. I I'm not saying it's a scam. I'm just not happy about it, right? All right. <laughs> about a year ago, I'm like, I'm going in, I'm securing things, I'm blocking. If you're working in this office on a network, you can't access certain websites, you can't gamble like, and other stuff, good right? Good for you. Good. Okay. So I go to Cox and I said, hey, I'm trying to find a way to block websites, block keywords, things like that. Yeah. They said, well, okay, you need security. Yeah. Okay, whatever. They put me in touch with their uh, Cox security mm-hmm. thing, which is just mm-hmm. McAfee. And it's uh, an extra 30 something dollars a month, maybe 40 or 50 I don't know. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, so I get it. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, now time, I need to block websites. Yeah. We need to call McAfee. Yeah. Okay. So I'll try and get. Try this is pretty get, recent. This is about, this is actually about at this time, about 18 months ago, this happened. Okay. Okay. So I try to get McAfee, try to get, I can't figure it out. Yeah. So there's this guy here who's working as an intern. His name's Will. Yeah. <clears throat> I said, Will, here's what I'm working on. And uh, he's like super, like, yeah. Like smart. Yeah. Right. Above my pay grade. All right. I, yeah. I get it. I'm a C student. I'm okay with that. <laughs> so, so he starts, yeah, same here. He starts working on it. And figures out how I can log into the gateway on the back end of Cox's stuff. Cool. Gets me my password yeah. and says, here you go. Just go in and type in what keywords you don't like in any specific website you just want blocked. Yeah. Like that done. Yeah. I didn't need an extra subscription through McAfee yeah. Yeah. that Cox was trying to sell me. Yeah. It was just having an understanding of how to get into the, well, I guess I call it the wireless gateway. Yeah. And yeah. go in there and do it. Yeah. And they could have just said, hey, yeah, go in here. No, they weren't going to do that. They're just going to push me off to pay, pay for That's something. That's right. That's right. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, this is this is why we exist and why companies like us exist because people trust us to do the right thing. That's and right. You have clients or you have you know providers like that that will sell you managed security products that aren't really doing anything. You know, like, so here's, a, here, you can't really secure an organization unless you understand how the organization works. Um who the people are, uh, what their technology is. You can't just say, I'll oh, just bolt on McAfee. That, that's the way it used to work, you know, 20 years ago. But like for me, 
you know, like what, what type of risk does an organization have? So like, um, we have some clients where, you know, one risk is that client, that employees would steal money from them. Well, how I can't just sell you an antivirus because I can't, I can't do a, something that protects you from an outside attacker. That's not going to help you from an insider employee theft. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, so there's all these different threats that businesses have and organizations have, and you have to determine what's the right solution. And the only way you can do that is by actually understanding the way they operate and who they are. Um, if, if, you know, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So that's what, it, have you ever read The Seven Habits? I've Highly not. successful people? Oh, mm. man. Put it on the bookshelf. Um, it's awesome. That reading's hard. I have, that'll be an audio Audiobook, audiobook. yeah. Okay, oh, it's a audio. classic. Okay. It is, it, like, to me, it's one of those, like, people are like, what are your favorite books? I'm like, you know, you got the Bible, Seven Habits. I mean, it's like one of those, it's a real classic. I mean, it's been around for a long time. But there's one in there that says, seek first. Uh, one of the habits is seek first to understand, then to be understood. And that's one of those I think about, like with your Cox experience. They didn't try to understand what you were really trying to do. They were just telling it. Well, this is what we. This is the security thing we solved. And then you just kind of blindly trust them. And, hey, it's a big organization. When they know what they're talking mm-hmm. about, boom, and they're done. That's right. Yeah, and it stinks and it costs you money for no reason. Yeah. So you have three biological kids. Three. But you have four kids. That's right. Foster. Yes, sir. How's that? Oh my gosh. Um, and and why? Yeah. Well. I mean, I have to. If you really want to know the true answer to why, I will tell you. And, and it's a little bit. Is there any, like any taboo subjects? We like not talking about politics. We're not talking about anything. Or is there anything? <clears throat> we don't want to talk about Donald Trump and Joe Biden. I will not talk about them. <laughs> there's, there's not really. No, there's not. So I'll tell you. Whenever, whenever I'll tell you what it was is whenever Roe v. Wade was overturned, um, we had been considering fostering, and I said to myself, okay, to my wife, I said, if we're going to be a country that says you have to have children, and now we have these unwanted children, then we have to do something. Like my wife, I have to do something. Not like go to the ballot box, not go to the picket line, not like hold up signs and not just you know get on social media. Like I have to do something because now we're going to have a bunch of children who were not wanted. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, I don't know how else to say it, but and so we chose to foster because now we're going to have you know we're going to have this influx over the next X number of years. Um, and so we went and we did, um, a fast track, you know, it's, a, it's, a, you have to get licensed and it's like a 30 hour class. Like wow. it's a big deal. Um, you learn all these different stuff. Some of it's good. Some of it's like just a waste of time, but they're, they, you know, they teach you a lot of good stuff. Um, so you get licensed. So we licensed, uh, we, we took our, um, one of my, was my office, but you know, office slash guest room, we converted it. We got, you know, three beds in there. So our house is now licensed for three beds. And we did this last year. And, um, yeah, I mean, we started getting placement calls and that's, that's when you realize like how much of a problem we have, um, is you get anybody who's been in the foster system, you get licensed and all of a sudden your numbers out there and you start getting calls and imagine like sales, you know, like you get those sales, your auto warranty is out of, you know, you Mm -hmm. get those calls. Imagine you get those like the same, you, the same frequency you get, you know, five of those a day, but instead of it being an auto warranty, it's like, Hey, I've got a seven year old boy who needs a home. Mm. Ah, we, you know, and then you, like, we would take a placement, and we take, you know, our first place was a ten year old girl. Bring her in, and then you're getting more calls. Hey, I've got a set of uh, three sisters, eleven, seven, and four, and we need a placement for we need we need a home for them for three nights. You know, like something. And you're just like, I, I don't have any more beds. Like, imagine that. Like, so it's this it's this crazy roller coaster you go on. You're exposed to this whole like um, I don't know this whole community, if you will, of like hurting children whose, you know, parents have just made questionable choices. Sometimes, you know, just <clears throat> tough, you know, a lot of it's addiction, a lot of it's drugs and just a lot of that stuff. But you have these kids who are just in unsafe environments. Um, and the system is very like, it's not perfect. It's very broken. Um, but it also, it is working and it is a system that protects kids. So um, it's tough. I'll tell you the only, um, right now we have, we've have a placement um, to a little girl. We got her when she's three weeks old um, and we've had her, Um, she'll be next month, she'll be one year. Mm. Um, so a real wild, I mean, like she's like basically grown up with us. You know, we, we missed the nine months of gestation and we missed the first three weeks of her life. Other than that, she's been with us. Um, and, um, you know, I'll tell you, there's only one, there's only one hard part of fostering. You know, for us, we had a bunch of kids, like we're used to like diapers and all that. Like, that's not that, you know, um, you know, adding and, you know, having a bottle feed and just, you know, like the day in and day out, mm-hmm. like oh, waking up and doing stuff like it's kind of it kind of wears you a little bit. But that's not the problem. That's not the hard part. The hard part of fostering is 
n- not knowing whether a child, how long they'll be with you for. Like, you know, you, your kids, like, mm-hmm. you, you're imagining, like, I don't know if you're like me, like, like when my, my first daughter was born, she's eight now. Like, I just cried because, like, I imagined, like, her wedding day. Mm-hmm. Like, I just, like, her whole life, I'm like, oh, this is so cool. Like, college. Mm-hmm first car and like all this stuff this is gonna be amazing you know at, at she's like zero you know right. like still <laughs> um but then when you have a foster child you're like i don't know if she'll be here next week like i don't i don't know and like the this girl we have i'm like you know i might like i might walk her down the aisle like we might end up adopting her. it might be the way the case goes or some family member might step up and she goes back to a, a family member and like and i have no idea and i have and i have no control over that because I'm not, you know, the way fostering works is like, you're not their guardian. You're not like the state of Florida is, and then you're just providing care for them. So like the state of Florida steps in and says, this child's not safe. We are going to temporarily take custody of this child. You biological parents, you do not have custody of her. Temporarily, we're suspending your rights. And now we are her guardian, we the state. And then they give them to, you know, family like us or people who are licensed, um, and it's tough, man. I mean, it's just that that's the element that's hard. You know, I look at that, the grass are, you know, this morning before I came here and it, the thought comes up again, like, well, will I see her through high school or, you know, like I've started thinking like, man, I wonder what sport, like just kind of like, yeah. you ever deal with your kids? You're kind mm-hmm. of like looking, you're like, oh, she got the baby thighs. You're like, oh, she's going to be a softball player, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. or whatever it is. And I'm like, <clears throat> will she be, will I, will she be here in high school? You know I mean? Like, I don't know. So that's, that's the hard part. Honestly, it's the only hard part. Um, and usually people who get burned out, like people who foster and leave, that's what it is. Um, it's that you have, you go really attached yeah, and you they're get, gone. A, there's a bond, right? And mm-hmm. then it's over. Yeah. I mean, it's just, that's the hard part. And then you probably in the back of your mind wonder if they're okay. Oh, I, I know. I know. And that's you, isn't it crazy? I'm, I'm very thankful. Florida is very pro parent. And I ever think like if I ever messed up and I just did something really dumb and lost custody, you know, like, I don't know, whatever, you know, got into drugs or just if something, you know, I'm not dealing with any of that, but I'm saying if something like that happened, it's nice to know that like Florida is very pro parent Mm -hmm. and they give you a lot of chances like to, they want you to come back together. Sure. Um, But then sometimes parents just don't, they don't want to, you know, they just, or or it's not even, they don't want to. I think, I think every parent wants to, it's that they have to overcome something, whether that's a drug addiction or, you know, sometimes it's an abusive partner, you know, right. like, you know, it's a very common thing where a, wa- a woman is with an abusive partner. And as long as he's in the house, the child can't be in there, you know, and she doesn't want to leave because then that's security loss. So there's a lot of there's just all these different factors. Um, but, you know, it's it's tough. Um, I, I can't I can't describe to you going into a courtroom. I, I remember in, in high school. You, do you ever heard teen court? Yeah, I've heard that. Did you ever do it? No. Oh, no. you would be, you would love teen court. I just imagine you, yeah, yeah. Um, basically kids, it was like a deferred prosecution thing okay. for kids, teenagers, Latcher County. They might still do it. The sheriff's office did I know they do. It. Do they? Yeah. Oh man, I would love to go visit. Um, super cool. They have like a whole trial and all that, but you're already guilty. Like the kid's guilty and you're just basically going before a jury, which is all other teen court participants. And then they get like sentence. It's like community service. You know, the jury can give you punishments, like write a letter to the victim and just that mm. kind of stuff. They have a, a, a checklist. And I remember doing that in the old courthouse, that brown, you know, which is now the family courthouse. Right. And it's weird because now, like, I go back there into these same rooms, like, on the same mm-hmm. floor and talk about a child's life and where they're going to be for the rest of their life. And you just sit there and you hear a judge and bump, 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 and they just fly through it. And you're like, oh, my gosh. And then you walk out and you just tears come. And you're like, this child's life is their, their future is being determined by just five minutes of just attorney to this, boom, 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 judge. Okay. Yep. All right. Case plan's going this way. Mom's not doing that. Dad's doing this. Okay. Rights are gone. And you're like, oh my gosh, like she's changing this kid's future. Like, and you just, and it happens so fast. Yeah. And you're just standing there like my whole body's just tight because you're like, uh, you know, and mm. then you process it, you know, on the drive home. And, um, and, and so my wife and I've gotten better about that. We're like, we plan before and after and like we sit down for lunch and we just try like, cause there's a lot of emotion that you process with that. Mm. It's not just like you know, quick hearing or something like that, a quick business meeting, like this is a child's future. You, um, <clears throat> I know somebody who was on one side where they, I guess foster is probably a good word to use. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that there was a full, there, yeah, I think they got guardianship. Yeah. However, the um, biological mother yeah. was sort of still in yeah. her life and yeah. the family, and they made it difficult. Yeah. 
because the kid had, yeah, the kid didn't wasn't doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, and the one who has the guardian who is now in the middle, like she's yeah. there stepping up trying to take care of this girl and give her a better life. Yeah, she doesn't want to do what she's asked to do, and you got the family of here who's still on drugs and different things who mm. are kind of like trying to pull at her, and I yeah. want to talk to them and. Kind of puts you in the middle. I don't know. Yeah. Have you been, have you been in the middle of anything like I've that? I've not done anything like that. There, there's <clears throat> cases like that where like, and, and that's not, that's a little bit different where like somebody steps up and they could be a guardian and, you know, you can do certain things with the state. Like the system that I'm, that we're a part of is basically where a child is forcibly taken by DCF. Like the parents are not consenting to it. This is mm. like the stuff you read about where like, yeah. you know, a kid comes to school and has bruises and then they investigate and it finds out like, Hey, this is probable you know, that dad beat her too much. You know, those are the types of cases where a, a sheriff's deputy shows up and they're taking the child and then they go into a foster. Like, you know, this is the state of Florida foster system. And there's a whole nother subset where like you're saying, where sometimes there's just, they go with a family member or a guardian and they can do that kind of stuff. And then they fight back and forth. And that's a little bit different. Um, but yeah, man, it's tough. I can't imagine. <clears throat> you know, I don't. I'm not judging anybody else. However, yeah. I can't imagine hitting, abusing a helpless kid who's yeah. small and weak, and yeah. young, and doing that kind of thing. One of the big things they they train you um, in in preparing for fostering is that you are you're simultaneously taking care of the child and trying to you're rooting for the parent, like. Okay. This is like I think about like a birth mother. That's her flesh and blood. Like that child. Yeah. It's not my flesh and blood. Like if like I'm thinking about the the daughter we have right now. Like if we end up adopting her, like we'll, we're choosing to adopt her and she comes into our family, but she's not my flesh and blood. You know, in some ways maybe it's better. I kind of tell my kid. You know, I'll probably tell my kids this. It's like, hey, I didn't have a choice. Like they popped out. You know, like our biological mm-hmm. kids, they popped out, and like. That's us, like yeah. versus the foster. Like we we chose, we made decisions and chose to bring her in. Um, so in some ways, <laughs> she's kind of getting preferential treatment. Sure, I <clears throat> I'm not sure if I have it, um, and I'll, I'll know in two seconds. I saw this video where this guy uh, had changed his um, oh his num his name on the back of his his name his yeah. name was uh, he changed it to his and I don't have it here his stepfather. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, had been his dad his whole life. And yeah. He went up to him and he said, look, and he, his dad, I think his dad was probably 70 at the time, uh, his stepfather, really. Yeah. And then he said, look, it's official. And he showed him the back of his jersey and just lost oh. it crying. He's like, you're my dad. Mm. And so, yeah, that's wonderful. That's that, uh, I don't, to, to step up and do what you're doing is amazing. It's, you know, you know I feel like we live in a culture where <laughs> it's all about like the extremes and like, let's do the most, like. You know, like, let's take the White House. Let's do this. Let's take this whole area. Like, you know, everybody wants to do everything. And it's like, what about just one kid? You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I get it. Like, you're trying, okay, we want to do this, and we want to donate to this party, or we want to do, you know, support this, you know, let's go to this gala and support this thing and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, why don't you just change one kid's life? You know, just just change one. You know, like, that's it. All you have to do. And because that's the hard, you know, we, and we donate. Like, we, we definitely, sure. you know, like – We've been financially blessed, so we give to like we give to Foster Florida, which supports foster families. They I love their mission because they give like our business gives um, a portion of our revenue to them, and they actually support like foster families like individual needs mm. stuff that like you know you get a placement, which is just you know a kid that comes in and all of a sudden they need a car seat. You don't have a car seat. Car seats are expensive. Yes, they you are. Know? And it's like hey, I need three hundred bucks for a car seat, and they'll buy you a car seat wow. for your foster. You know, just those kind of things are getting cribs and just the stuff that you need to care for a kid. But, um, yeah, I mean, like, I don't know. That's If I could change one thing about, you know, I'm, I mean, I guess I'm younger. I'm 37. But, like, I feel like a lot of us who are younger, like, we want to change the whole world. Like, you know, like, that's the thing with social media now is, like, man, my platform, I could reach 50,000. I could reach 500,000. We see the Mr. Beasts of the world. who are, like, 100 million. And we're like, mm-hmm. man, if I could just have 100 million. And that, like, so many young people just want to be a, a social media influencer and influence all these people because – I mean, I think we all want to accomplish something. We all want to do some good, sure. right? I mean, that kind of innate in us. And it's like, well, let me do the most good. It's like, well, what if you just change one kid's life? Like, just one. That's it. Like, if this one kid, like, what if we adopt her and we never foster again? Like, my wife and I have talked mm-hmm. about that. And we've just changed one kid's life. And that's it. Yeah. Like, I feel like that would be that would be okay. Sure. Like, I don't need to go on some platform and try to raise awareness and donate all this money and do all this. Like, just let me just take care of and raise one kid and that's it. And you did your part. 
Yeah, and I think I think some of it, you know, I had never really thought about until I'm sitting here talking with you, but like my grandmother, you know, she was born in 1915. And like, she, I think she didn't see electricity till she was like 17 or something like that. Mm-hmm. And she was in, she was born in a time period where they didn't have social services. Like they didn't have like adoption agents, that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. But, and she was essentially didn't really know who her real mother was. And she lived with like her uncle. And that's not really sure. Didn't really know where she <clears> came <throat> from, you know? And so I think that kind of planted that seed for us is like, Hey, there are, unfortunately there's unwanted kids, you know? And I don't, I, I want them to go back to their parents. I don't judge the parents, but like they just need to be cared for. Makes it harder for me now that I have kids. <clears throat> if yeah. you didn't have kids, you don't almost understand it. Mm-hmm. Once you have kids, you go, someone who's unwanted. Yeah. And I think for me, it's like I start looking at my two daughters and going, I can't imagine them not being wanted yeah. and loved. But it's it's the reality, you know? Yeah. Um, I've enjoyed our conversation, Eric. Yeah, man. Man, it was really cool. So we had AI to foster, Jake. Yeah, I had a foster. We did that <laughs> all over the place, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Covered everything. No, well, not everything. Almost everything. Covered covered my passions. You know, last thing I'll tell you, Jake, what, uh, Eric, what I'm seeing more in, uh, even in the pro sports is sort yeah. of, you talk about taboo. Tim Tebow, when he was talked a lot about religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it seemed to be kind of get frowned upon at the NFL level, like you're doing too much. Yeah. But now I'm seeing these other athletes that are actually doing it a lot. Yeah. And they're open about it. Yeah. And it's kind of being embraced. And now I'm seeing it more on social media. Like, yeah. uh, you know, Deion Sanders was doing it at the college level. The, um, the guy from the Saints, I saw his video. Like, I'm, I'm terrible with pro sports. You know who I'm talking about? I don't know which athlete you're talking about. Uh, he, plays, <clears throat> um, he plays from New Orleans. And he basically, like, preached a sermon in a press conference. I'm sorry, Coach. No, you're honest. good. Yeah. You're good. Orlando Magic has a player that's doing it and being, yeah. you know, uh, standing up and saying, I'm not going to hide anymore. And yeah. I'm going to tell you, you yeah. know, who, who my um, – who I pray to and yeah. what I believe. And yeah. not that they're trying to preach to anybody, but just now being comfortable and saying it and giving, yeah. you know, the, the, the credit where they believe it should be. And that's right. Um, it's, it's been very interesting to see. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I love, I love that. It's, it's funny you bring that topic up and it, it, it's so taboo. I think there's such a political correctness and you just don't want to offend anybody. And, you know, like, you know, I think inside, inside of our organization, like we have, there's a lot of laws, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of things that protect, um, it protects discrimination. I think that's what a lot of people, I think, I think maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, there was a lot of discrimination around religion where like people, okay, well, if you're not this religion, if you're not Christian, if you're not this, then you're not going to be treated the same way. And that's not right. You know, that's not right. But there's a difference between treating somebody else differently for their religion versus saying, saying what your beliefs are. Those mm-hmm. are two different things. Right. And I think that for a long time, we kind of, as a society, confused that. And we thought it was the same thing. And it's like, no, it's not, you know, like, you know, I, I, I'm very comfortable talking about what I believe, but like, I also love hearing what other people believe. Like, I'm not, I don't change, it doesn't change my view of them. Like, Hey, you don't believe this. You don't do such and such. Like that doesn't bother me. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to treat you or prefer you more or less, but, um, yeah, I mean like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. My, my my hope, if I could have one, I need, I need more than one wish, but if I could have one wish in the world, it'd be that I could say the most nasty derogatory thing. I could ever say to you, okay, and you not put your hands on me, and you not pull out a gun, and you not try to hit me. Um, well, you want to go for it because I, I can't reach across I the table. I don't have a gun. That's, that's, the, that's the one thing I could not do on this podcast. I think people let words sometimes, and it turns into these huge arguments and fights yeah. and these nasty yeah. things. And it's like for what? Yeah. Because yeah. someone said something and it made you upset. Like yeah. you think about road rage and people getting into it, and you cut me yeah. off. I've gotten cut off before. You know how I respond to it. Mm. Two hands on the wheel and do the best I can. That's right. I mean, I'm like, well, I'm like, chase after them and start cussing them out and get shot. I'm, I'm good. Right, I, right. I wish people just had more tolerance and just. I don't. I don't. I. I don't like things to escalate. Like, That's right. Like, let's not. Let's not go there. And That's so. That's right. Because you and you know it's a good practice because someday in the future you're going to be the guy who is late for an appointment, probably taking your kid to a doctor's appointment, yeah. and you have to do the cutting off. Because you, to. you know what I mean, and you're the one who's doing, and you're going to need the understanding, and yep. you're going to be the guy who like, oh, I'm, I'm taking my daughter to this uh, critical appointment where she's checking on this brain thing that I'm That's all nervous point. about, and I forgot that I need to make my turn, and then I accidentally cut somebody off, and they're back there, bah, bah, and you're going to remember I gave grace to that person how many years ago, yeah, or whatever it was, I let it go, and I expect the same thing, and Hopefully. you want them to, hey, absolutely, you don't yeah, want them to pull a gun on it, you. It, well, I hope not. Just please, <laughs> just don't shoot me. I've got to watch my college football. Gotta watch Florida. You could you could joke about my hair. That could be a derogatory thing. I have no hair. 
you haven't had hair for a long time. I haven't. Fun fact, um, Jake, you might not know this. Eric May was elected as a city commissioner in the city of High Springs, Florida, at the age of 23. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was the youngest ever elected in High Springs. Long time ago. And I came in in uh, a few years later in Alachua and was elected when I was 26. Yeah. You were elected in 08, 09, maybe? 2009. 2009. Yeah. So I was 2010 in Alachua, youngest ever, 26 years old. And both of us, I, I'm not going to speak for you, probably, I don't think you're doing politics anytime soon. Mm-mm. No. You're, sp- you're supposed to do it later in life. <laughs> yeah. We got it out of the way. Like, yeah, we're good. early on. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. But, you know, it's good. I mean, you get you get experience. I mean, like, it's it's super, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't regret, you know, I wouldn't go back and undo it. Um, you know, you, you learn how to deal with people. I mean, yeah. you sit on a dais and you have people yell at you and you have to make these important decisions. And you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing, you know. I had a lady tell me I was going to hell okay. in a meeting. Oh, I'm oh sorry. yeah. She goes, you're a liar. And I was like, I don't think yeah. I'm lying. And so after the meeting was over, um, I'm sitting there and she comes up to me along with one of her other um, ladies and just can't believe you sat up there and lied. And I said, I didn't lie. What are you talking about? Yeah. And I said, here's what I said. I said, I've got my notes written down. Yeah. I said, I'm prepared. I said, I said this and this and this. She goes, you're a liar. That's not what you said. And you're going to hell. You're going to have to answer to God for this. This Aww. is literally what she says. It's like, Oh my gosh. At this moment I should walk out of these chambers and just go home, but I can't. Yeah. So I go to the video room and I said, Can you run back the meeting? Go to this spot. Yeah. I pull out my iPhone. <laughs> I said, Turn it up, press play. I recorded the sixty seconds of where I spoke that I lied and I'm going to hell for it. Yeah. And I went outside. She's outside talking. I said, Can I show you something? Yeah. And she watched it and she goes, Okay. So what? What do you want? A cookie? I was like, <laughs> actually. Yes, I do. Oh, a cookie would be nice. Yeah, cookie, a cookie would be nice right now. Isn't that just... funny? But isn't, that, isn't that so funny when you disagree with people? Like people can hear and think like something completely different, mm-hmm. and convinced of it. Yeah, I talk... I've been on that side where like my wife and I get into a huge, a huge fight, and she's like convinced of. I'm convinced. Like I said this. She's like, no, no, and I'm like, I'm. And how do you reconcile it? <laughs> right. You know? Sure. Yeah. Well, these people that are, uh, exist in every community in America, they there's do. nothing you can do. They do. You just have to know who they are and. Go. That's right steer clear so that's right and it it makes you have a lot of grace for people that serve that's right you know oh yeah like people are all like oh joe biden is president sorry i said i said the buzzword oh it don't matter president whoever and i'm just like man you just don't know what they're dealing with like you don't understand like the weight that's on their shoulders i mean even at like a local level like some of the stuff the pressure that these elected officials deal with like you gotta cut them some slack stop believing (laughs) the worst in them you know and i what i've told people um you know, a lot of times it's like, well, the state representative so-and-so lied and they did this. I said, well, let me explain something to you. Do you realize how many different lobbyists and groups are pulling at them? Mm-hmm. Every association from fire yep. and teachers to realtors to Planned Parenthood, to the, they all have these different groups pulling. Yeah, yeah. And, they're, and, and not all the time. Don't get, I do have an issue with the ones who try, sort of get in. And, I, and, I, and I'll just say it. I was thinking this yesterday. Joe Biden. <coughs> okay. There are some very – and he's older. And I, I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> there are some very sensitive subjects um, that he's discussed. Yeah. And, I, and I thought about how much he smiles at press conferences. Yeah. And I thought, if these were issues that I was talking about that are serious, there's nothing to smile about. Yeah. I can't smile and make a joke as I walk out as if everything yeah. I just said was I was serious for 60 seconds. And then not just Joe Biden. Others do it because they don't live it. It's like um, when you go through something, mm-hmm. you become more passionate about it. And these folks are sort of just not all right. I know Joe Biden and others have their passions and probably mm-hmm. there he's more serious. Mm-hmm. But just yesterday I'm watching him talk about, I don't know if this was the border or something. He's just kind of smiling and he turns around the border. He kind of makes a joke and it's like, so the moment we're acting up here is what we're doing. We're going to yeah. be serious for five minutes. Can I say what I need to say? And as I walk out, I'm going to smile because it's all funny now. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know. I just, he, he strikes me as that's, that's his style. Like, I, you know, I, and I say that because like my dad's like that. He's very like, cheery, happy-go-lucky, even if it's like a serious thing, he kind of is like that. And I just, I think there are some people like that's, I don't know if it's a coping mechanism mm-hmm. or if it's just their style, but like to them, if life is not, if there's not some fun in it, like it's very scary. I know sure. people like that. I don't know how much you're into like personality tests and that kind of stuff, but there are personalities out there. I know people who are like that. And I'm just like, can't you ever be serious? And they're like, no, not really. Like, you know, it's hard. <laughs> well, that, you know. I'm not a very serious person. Yeah, I like to laugh about everything, but yeah. when there is an issue that's serious, yeah, like you, if you really care and you're passionate, I think you really you like no, we we can't 
make a joke up here. We, yeah. There's nothing funny about this. People yeah. are depending on us to, I don't know, but I, found, I, but I, I do funny. understand every personality is different. Yeah. Um, and you know, we'll see what happens, but yeah, since we gave Biden some airtime, we'll give some, we'll give Trump some airtime. This is really funny, right? So you saw what happened, right? They just I keep out. I do not follow politics. Okay. I really don't. Well, we don't have a speaker of the house in this. Okay. Night. I did okay. hear about that. Okay. So Donald Trump gets out on his want to be true social thing and says, um, uh, why are we fighting each other? We should be fighting the Democrats and blah, blah, blah. Right. And so I hear two pundits on TV go, I actually agree with Trump on that. And it's like, what do you agree with Trump on that? Trump is the one who's been running his mouth about his own people for how many years now? Now all yeah. of a sudden he's the great uniter. Yeah. I, I'll, I can go off on both of them and both parties. Yeah. Come on. I don't. It, it's it's just a game. It's, it, it, it's a racket. I want someone who's honest and shoots straight and it's not. Yeah beholden to this audience and this group and then you can go man that's someone when i hear them speak tucker carlson mm -hmm. you know he's a big trump person big yeah. whatever then behind the scenes he sends out a private text message that says he trump's the worst president ever can't wait till he's oh, did gone. that come out or something well he yeah they, when his uh was submitted submitted to uh uh to the uh people doing the yeah, the in investigations into the oh, okay. election stuff. Okay, yeah, 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 it was yeah. his text messages, and it's like, which Tucker are you? That is weird. Give me the real person, and I got That's it. That's what people want, isn't that what the next generation? I mean, can you imagine being like twenty two or twenty three, and like you're thinking about next year's election, and it's the same two guy, probably the same two guys from last time, who are both <laughs> like in eighty. Yeah, I know. And I'm not, I'm not advocating one or the other. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But it's just like it's probably going to be the same election. Like it's just it like if there's that, gonna be one difference. Okay. Uh, when Biden does his campaign event to <coughs> on election night, there won't be cars out parked outside because his was out, outside before and he were honking their horns. It's oh, like huge, COVID! Yeah. Can you imagine what history is gonna look back at a hundred years from now and look at this and go, "What the heck was going on then?" <laughs> <laughs> have, have you go to Disney? You, are you Disney? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, Hall of Presidents. You ever gone in there? Is that in the Epcot part or is that, that actually is in, in Magic Kingdom? Yeah. I, I've never been in that part. Oh now. my gosh, you have to go the, because they have animatronic presidents. They have really? all the presidents, and they all speak. And as the years have progressed, their animatronics have gotten better. So of course they have you know Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. They have guys you know George Washington. They have every president there. Um, now I haven't been. I don't know if they've added Biden in, um, but I was. I went in there probably in the last two years, and they had a Trump animatronic. And the, <laughs> I mean, it is so. You think he's standing on the stage? Really? Oh yeah. Oh, it's so cool. And they all stand and they talk. It's oh yeah. Oh, I gotta do a that. History buff. Oh yeah, you would absolutely love it. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Jake, what do you think, man? Been a good show. Very good show. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, we just we wanted to cover everything. After you said we hadn't covered everything, we did. We went to the taboo Trump Biden. So yeah. Eric, thank you, man, good. so much. Thank I enjoyed you for it. Having me, appreciate yeah, your time. It was great, for Thank sure. You.